Get out. That's it. Get out. Take that one out. Take one. Oh, careful. Oh, oh, oh. Just one, two, three. Yeah. Um, for some of you, you know Deanne Kasokil from Callmaker. Is your new place? Oh. Hello. I can't hear myself. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Oh, there you go. I can hear myself now. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, Diana Waria, uh, she's a lawyer, and uh, um, she's been doing this cows and cows along with Rachel Snow. Rachel Snow is from Alberta. Uh, Morley? Yes. Yeah, Morley. She's a lawyer. This cows and plows over that they've been going around doing, it's, uh, I was very interested because uh, some of the flaws that they have, some of the settlement agreements. Um, so I'll tell you what I to elaborate on that. Um, I got a presentation, I got to talk about it. I got to talk about question and answer period. I got to Please stick to the issue of cows and plows, maybe other issues, you know. I know we have a lot of band issues that we can, if you want to stay, we can maybe talk about those other issues that we have. Um, but um, I, I would like to also uh, discuss the process of those cows and plows. Lawyers, skate um, I worked in Alberta and um, these reserves, the one reserve that uh, I worked for, went through this whole process and I was right there working for them at the time. So I have a little bit of the, I know, I know a little bit about the process. But some of the things I was a little concerned about on, you know, on besides cows and plows is, uh, our audits, 2018 and 19 was the last time seen. And then four years now, we haven't seen an audit. The other the other issue I, uh, I, I would like to know, where is the Headley's at regarding the casino land mm -hmm. and uh, where the gas bar sits? Those are issues that uh, I would like to know, but I don't know if we we'll have time to talk about those today, but uh, Anyway, um, I'll pass it on to Diane. But I like everybody to be respectful and uh, um, courteous. Things happen and we have to move forward. So that's what I want to, I want to, like for this meeting to be. Gitumawa chief and council. Uh the chief Gito we bait of it. Um I let Carl know give me some arm in the gotcha mustawata you put the council. So um I hope they show up. Okay. It's just hard like yeah. We just use this one? No. You okay. don't want to hear you. Oh. <laughs> you don't hear you. Um, Dagunjawa, Nitacha Stubby. Uh, before I start, uh, I just want to go around and see all the people in the room, who, who you are, your name, and uh, your reserve, I guess, if you're from here. Start with you, Janago, that way. Clockwise. 
<laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Janelle. I'm here. I'm helping out with the Zoom today. Um, name where I'm from. Uh, my parents are gay and so me. I don't know if we need to pass my click. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, uh, my name is Plastic Gordon. I'm from Little Pine, North Nation. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name is Jerome Meyer Joe. Little Pine Red. Hi, my name is Leon Baptiste, Little Pine. My name is Andrew Johnson, I'm from Little Pine. Yeah. Hubert Johnson, she's a sonista. Little Pine. Hmm. From Little Pine. Um, I want to tell you a little story about some people who are there, and he works with a East Indian, and uh, his name is Apple. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah, because Tokyo can make a cremation. What? Do we use this one, Jenny, or do we use this one? Okay. This one? Oh. Everybody got exercise. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, my name uh, my name is uh, Moia. That means uh, Thunder Woman. And uh, or else, uh, my name is Rachel Snow. I come from uh, Minithni. That's Morley, Alberta. We live right under um, the Rocky Mountains. And my late father was. Uh, Reverend Dr. Chief John Snow. He used to fight a lot for treaty in Alberta, just the same way that uh, people here in Saskatchewan fought with the uh, FSIN or fought for FSIN, the way uh, Senator or John Tatusas went around. My late dad did that too in Alberta. They visited all these reserves. They talked to people, talked to the elders, talked to the people when things were changing in our communities. So uh, my late dad was a chief for a long time and he raised us to go to, um, we go to ceremony, we go to uh, Sundance, we go to talks, meetings where there's elders so that we can, we can learn about our people and we can learn about uh, the history of who we are. This is how I learned about treaty. I learned by listening to elders, listening uh, at meetings, listening to people talk, tell stories, uh, pass those stories down. And uh, that's where I get my information. Then when I was uh, 46, I went back to school to go get my uh, law degree, University of Saskatchewan here in Saskatoon. I got my law degree, but I didn't become a uh, practicing lawyer. I wanted to go around to our reserves and help our people write our laws in our languages instead of following uh, non-native uh, Munial laws. So that's kind of the work that I've been 
that's the work that I've been doing for the last uh, 10 years. Before that, I worked in um, with the uh, treaty chiefs. I write for the treaty chiefs policy advisor briefing notes. I look at uh, the legislation, the things that white, white man, white government is writing and I explain it to the chiefs or explain it to councils. So I've been doing this work for a long time, about 40 years. Um, I've been working with uh, trying to see what the government is doing and give that information to our people. So when I when we started reading, when uh, Deanne told me um, about this, we, when she said we should go on the road and tell our people, I said, yes, we have to go tell our people because some of our people don't even understand what the treaty is. The treaty is not that document that was signed like Treaty 6 or Treaty 7. Treaty starts before, treaty starts before in our, the way we, the way we are with, uh, with Waka, the way we are with Creator, the way we are with everything in creation, the way we have an agreement with uh, the plants, the animals, the land, waters, everything four-legged, the winged creatures, that's where that's where that that relationship starts, and from that relationship, we have an attachment, or we're we're part of the land, and the land is part of us. So we can't we can't separate from that land. This is the way um, I was taught to always protect protect the land, look after the land, and to fight um, the non-native or the white government if they came in or if they were trying to do something to our people. So from for a long time, I think, I have understood the treaty means uh, we are responsible. We have obligations. We're supposed to look after this treaty. I have to, I have to do that. I have to teach my children to do that. I have to teach my grandchildren to do that. The same way my mom and dad taught me, I have to do that myself in this, while I'm here on this earth. So that's part of the reason why we're going around and uh, talking to people, explaining to them that uh, a treaty uh, that we're talking about is not um, just the number of treaties. We're talking about the original instructions from the creator, what was told to us. That's the most important part that we need to know to go on. And then uh, we talked to an uh, elder in uh, Alberta Jimmy OGC does a lot of work with the treaty. And he was telling us that the very first treaty starts after 1763 Royal Proclamation. 1764 is the Treaty of Niagara. Treaty of Niagara is where Pontiac brought together over 2000 chiefs. They sat together, they decided that they will have the great law of peace, that we will work together because they're newcomers settlers, white people coming in. So we have to do something. We have to stick together. We have to work together. So from that great law of peace, they didn't write it down in a piece of paper. The way they the way they kept that was they put it into a uh, Turo Wampum. The Turo Wampum belt, you can see um, the white background, and then you can see the purple, like uh, a line that goes forward. That's the uh, um, Muniaos riding on their canoe, they go forever forward and they don't come onto our, we're onto the river or the stream we're on. The other line is for our people, it's for the uh, Native American people, the First Nations, the Nehiao, Haudenosaunee, Nakoda, whatever we are, that line goes on like that forever too, but it doesn't go into the other lane. That's what's been happening now though. Um, we've, we've been our people have been getting from this canoe into the other canoe. I've been going over and getting into the Muniao canoe and trying to bring that back to our communities. And it's it's not gonna work. When uh, when we first signed uh, after after the Treaty of Niagara, after the two row wampum, uh, Canada started coming west, trying to make treaties with us because they want the land. Um, American American people are coming north. They're trying to take the land too. At the same time, um, in uh, Saskatchewan, Louis Riel, the Métis, they're uprising. So there's a lot of things happening. 
why Canada wanted to, or why the British Crown wanted to make treaties with the with the First Nations. So they made these treaties, but what our ancestors said is not written in those treaties. What's written in those treaties is what the white government officials put in the treaties. The white government officials say, uh, we agree to see it and surrender forever. And we agree for one square mile per family of five, um, a schoolhouse, medicine chests, uh, tools, implements, cows and plows. That, that's all the white man's writing in that document. Where's the part where our ancestors said, we wanna have um, a good life. We wanna have a uh, healthy, healthy, uh, healthy home for our children. We wanna be able to still hunt and gather or work so that we can feed our families. Those things are not in the treaties. So when we talk about the treaties and a lot of young people now, when they talk about the treaties, they talk about, they say my treaty rights. They only look at that treaty like they got education rights, health rights, cows and plows, um, $5 a year. They're forgetting like our ancestors also talked at the time of treaty. Our ancestors also said, uh, we want this to be included. We want this to be in the treaty because they came with um, they came with ceremony. They thought about what they were doing for us into the future. There's uh, in my in my family um, in Treaty Seven when that was signed. My family, my uh, my daughter-in-law's family has a story. Her great great grandpa, Tatanga Money, Walking Buffalo went to the treaty signing when he was uh, five years old. He rode on a donkey. He was with his, he was supposed to help his grandmother. And he said, when we got to the, when we got to the treaty site, they stayed up on the hill by Blackfoot Crossing because the Blackfoots were our enemies, so we didn't want to go down. He also said they had to stay there for a few days because um, they kept praying up on top of the hill. Later on, when I was talking to the elders, the elders told me there were nine pipes there. So they used those nine pipes every day, one pipe per day, and did the ceremonial things they needed to do so that when they went to go and negotiate, they'll be coming in with uh, all the help from uh, the creator that they, all the help from the creator and doing it in a good way. We also had um, a song uh, that uh, the warriors sang protecting the camp at night as they went around the camp. And uh, we still have that song in our language, still back at home today. Those things, um, those things that are so powerful, that's that's who we are as First Nation people. And it's sad when you think that so many of our people are homeless or in urban areas, um, addictions, suicides, incarcerated. We have a lot of, um, we have a lot of things that are um, really hard for our communities right now. I know that too, I live in my, I live in Morley. I, I've lived there my whole life, but we have a lot of funerals that happen every week. Sometimes we don't have uh, enough young men to watch the fire or to even um, dig or shovel when we're burying somebody. So the same problems or the same things that happen in this community or other communities, it happens in, happens in my community. We're hearing that as we travel, the same kinds of problems are happening. But it all comes from once we agree to share the land, that's what the treaty is. We agree to share. Uh, once we agree to share the land, the Munia, the non-natives, they didn't know how to share. All they know how to do is take. They took as much as they could pushed us off into reserves when they didn't when they needed to make more room or put a railway through or a road they pushed us to another site i was talking uh i was listening to somebody yesterday from musa men tell us that he was there first their reserve then they were moved to another spot so uh that's the kind of thing that the federal government did canada did because they don't care and so now Right now with our people across Canada, 
uh, and the historic treaties, that's where the cows and plows are. Cows and plows are only in treaties one to 11. Uh, cows and plows is not in uh, Robinson Huron treaties or in the uh, peace and friendship treaties of the Eastern tribes. Cows and plows is only in these Western, in these Western treaties. And what uh, we have cows and plows stories too in, in my community uh, that the Indian agent was supposed to bring uh, cattle and homes and uh, other farming tools. He was supposed to bring them out like once a, once a year. And that one year he came and he didn't have anything. And so the people, people went to go talk to the Indian agent. Where's, where's those, where's the cattle? Where's what you're supposed to bring? And he said that we have three bands in Morley, Chiniki, Bearspaw, Wesley, Goodstoney. The Indian agent said one of the bands already met him further east and they took everything. Took all the cattle, they took all the twine, ammunition, whatever the Indian agent had, they took it. So then the next year, all three bands went east before he got to Maine Morley to make sure they got some of those things that were supposed to come to the tribe. So this thing about the cows and plows and the agriculture, it's been going on for a long time. I've heard other stories when we're going to communities about uh, the Indian agent was supposed to bring a bull, didn't bring it, didn't come back for two years. Then you can't, uh, then you really can't have uh, a, a good farm or you can't domesticate your animals properly. Uh, the same thing with agriculture. Some of our people did really well with gardens, farming. And then so the Indian agent held them back, held back their, uh, what they harvested so that the Munia, the white people around them could sell their loads first. Then our people, the things that we had spoiled. So when we talk about those things, you can see already like 1800, 150 years ago, uh, the Munia, the white people were already doing things if we were going to have success, we could be, you know, how Saskatchewan is the, um, uh, Saskatchewan is like the agriculture, the wheat, the wheat land of, uh, of uh, North America. We could have been the ones who would be farming that. But every time we were successful, the Indian agent stopped us. That's when the past system started. Past system came to the reserve. We weren't allowed to leave unless we had a pass. So if you can't leave, uh, then you can't sell your goods. So every time that our people may have had success or may have done well, we were stopped by the non-native people. And this is the same thing that they're doing that's coming again right now with the cows and plows. They're trying to give us money for a treaty right, for a treaty provision. They're trying to give us uh, money for that and if they give us that money, it's one time they give us that money. And then uh, the way it's written is that we'll never, our grandchildren and no one else will ever be able to uh, ask the government uh, to give that, um, to give the agriculture funds to our, to our children or our grandchildren. The treaties are supposed to be forever. The treaties are for as long as the sun shines, the rivers flow, the grass grows. The treaties are supposed to go on. But if the treaties, uh, but if Canada starts to negotiate with our chiefs and councils and takes money instead of, uh, instead of our chiefs and councils arguing with Canada that that treaty goes forever and we can't take one-time money. We can't take one-time money. What we'll do though is we'll take this 30,000 now Next year you give us thirty thousand again. The next year you give us thirty thousand again. That's the argument that has to be made because Canada has taken so much from uh, from the land, uh, and they are the ones who are living good. They live well, and our people are in poverty. So there's more arguments or more things that can be done called the uh, the treaty right to cows and plows. And it's uh, more than just agriculture, which D will go into. But for right now, that's that's where we talk about. What I talk about is that the treaty is more than just those words. 
in treaty number six, the treaty is our relationship with the creator, our relationship with the land, our relationship here while we're Nehia or Nakoda or Haudenosaunee, while we're here on this earth, that's that's what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, we've been forgetting to teach that to our children and our grandchildren. And so now we have a lot of um, young people who are saying that I'm not gonna be a farmer, I don't care, give me the money. Uh, we have a lot of people thinking like that when long ago we used to think, um, we used to help each other and we used to think of one another and we didn't, uh, we didn't just try to help ourselves. But now we're thinking, uh, like the Muniao, we're colonized, we're assimilated. Uh, we think only for ourselves. Me, I want that money. I want a truck. I want this. So that's uh, that's why we're going around to communities too to remind people that um, we were always uh, collective. We always fought for each other. We always uh, camped with our our kinship, our our uh, extended family and clans to make a tribe or make a nation. That's what we did. That's how we lived. So if that's how we were, uh, I don't know, aside from, you know, residential school, other trauma, things that have hurt our people, why we've changed and a lot of influence from a white society coming in, all our kids on phones, all our kids playing games, uh, listening to, you know, music, whatever they're doing, they're not uh, listening to um, the Sundance songs. They're not being taught the songs that they need to learn for Sundance. They're not going into sweats and learning that each rock has a value. Those things that we, that hold our, our uh, laws, not we're not passing them on to the children. So that's something that uh, we have to do we have to remember our spiritual, we have to remember that we're spiritual people, that we, that prayer and that uh, the things that have been given to us, um, we're always told to be thankful, to be grateful. And then when we move forward or when we live in this world now, we have to remember those things that we were given, um, the prayers, the songs, the medicines, all the things that we were given so that we can go forward and have a good life and teach our kids and not become just brown people in the white world um, begging or with a living in road allowance and not having any not having any rights or anything in this land. But uh, I'm going to give it to Dee now because she'll talk more about the uh, House and Plows Agreement and what it means for the in in uh, what the what the government is trying to negotiate. I think it was gonna go there. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me back there? You can hear me. Um, again, my name is Dion Kosoki. I come from Palmaker Cree Nation. Um, I've been an Indian my entire life, not a pretendian. <laughs> Thought I'd put that out there since there's all the pretendians going out there giving out all this wonderful traditional knowledge to our people, the, the knowledge that we that you actually have within your community. It's great to be here in Little Pine uh, First Nation. I feel really good because next door is Palmaker, my home, right? So I remember uh, when I was working over there, we were trying to encourage Little Pine to build a wall. It didn't work out. I'm kidding. Anyways, I, uh, I've been a practicing lawyer of the Law Society for 15 years in good standing. Um, I'm currently, uh, I, I, I have my own um, law practice, so I... Um, work primarily and have always worked for my people on the ground, on the front line. I do a lot of criminal work this morning. I'm kind of tired today. This I was uh, we were presenting in Saskatoon last night. We didn't get done there until about 8.30 last night. I had to go home and, uh, you know, try and get some sleep. I was up, a clock, uh, up at six o'clock this morning working on, uh, I had a federal court case um, and that was uh, through Zoom with a judge from Ottawa who's French. And he has no clue 
about First Nations people. He has no clue about First Nations governance. He has no idea what it's like to live in a First Nations community and see the struggles that we go through on the daily and the trauma that we live on the daily and continue to live within our communities and that we continue to and have survived, right? So I have this judge on my case. He was basically trying to tell us Indians, you know, how we should run our own governance system. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm pretty sick of it. Being in this field for 15 years has really taught me that it's a system that I have made it in, but it's not a system that's meant for us. Absolutely not. And you know what? Pardon my language, but we're too fucked up in our communities to try and get it together to try and fight the government because we're too busy fighting each other. You know, the government is sitting here laughing at us right now as we take this cows and plows money for the little bit that they're offering us compares to our relationship to the land and our duty under treaty to uphold treaty and our duty and responsibility to treaty that we are not teaching our children and our grandchildren because what are the unborn going to have? Are they going to have that one-time payment, that agricultural payment? Probably not. This is, the, this is Canada's bill of sale that they need to prove in international court because they've never been able to prove an international court bill of sale for Canada. This is not Canada's land. Canada is a state. This is a settler state. We are very powerful with treaty. This is the whole reason why the government from time immemorial, the colonial agenda has always been to extinguish and exterminate the Indian. And to the very detriment of colonial policies that have affected us to this day, as to why we still continue to sit in our past. We sit in our trauma, we sit in our past, and we can't move forward because we'd rather exercise lateral violence against one another from what the residential school system, the day school system has taught us. Enough is enough. We have to learn to go back to who we are and where we come from. And based on those principles that we have been taught to love one another, to respect, number one, respect one another, love one another, be kind to one another, be humble. All of these things we forgot in the name of money. And that's what we've been hearing sadly across this tour is that people are saying, oh, I'm just waiting for my $25,000, $30,000. Are you kidding me? Do you have grandchildren? What about those ones that aren't here yet? What are they going to get? Because honestly, this money that they are offering us is nothing. I guess where that money comes from? It comes from the Indian Trust. That's our money. They're paying us our own money so they can take our land because that's the bill of sale that they need. Approved treaty. Because once you sign away, once we vote yes on the settlement agreement for cows and plows, that's it. They release, we are releasing Canada now and forever into the future. That is for sure. None of these settlement agreements can be changed. And I'm going to tell you why. And that pertains to the specific claims policy of Canada. So what, what they're doing, what the Canadian government is doing is they're taking our treaty rights, treaty rights, and legislating them and putting them into Canadian policy. This is why we're so powerful as nations because we hold that right to the land. So back in, in uh, when, when uh, Canada was, uh, when uh, John A. Macdonald was, uh, you know, uh, him and his uh, buddies there were so drunk that they stumbled into Confederation, they decided they had to move, the, they had to meet, get the, Canadian Pacific Railway from the east to meet the west. So who is in between? Who is in the prairies? Us, right? So in order for them to basically trespass onto our land to take the CP Railway across, they had to settle treaty. So that was their right to the land through treaty. Their use of the land. Look at now and look at what they've done. They put our lands into trust with the queen. So it's really like what they've done is they stole it and they duped our land. Questions after, please. So this is what that, that's what happened when they when when they when they settled the east to the west, they had to attain the land. That's how they've done it. Now, 
the colonial agenda has always been and the policies have always been to try and water down, limit, or basically exterminate the rights under treaty. And they're doing it through all kinds of policies. And let me tell you, when I used to be, a, when I did, a, when I was working on the residential school claims, I had a lawyer friend who worked in Ottawa. And he said, they have many lawyers. Department of Justice of Canada has how many lawyers? Many. And did you know that in 2000, I, this is when I was uh, pretty young, pretty young, 2010, I, I actually looked into um, how much the Canadian government cost to fight our rights was a, it's $120 million that year to fight our rights. Our nation, look at Little Pine Nation. Do you have a lawyer? Do you have an in-house legal counsel? Do you have an in-house legal counsel that works for your nation? That in-house legal counsel should be looking for the best interests of your rights here in the nation. Not their, not their interests. Does your does your lawyer come and visit you guys and say, okay, what are we going to do to combat this? Probably not. Because most likely you have a non-Indigenous lawyer or who works for a non-Indigenous firm that kind of just, you know, they go with the flow, right? That's, you know, that's how it goes. But the point is, is that your nation does not have the capacity of a legal representative that's fighting for your rights. And every nation should. And this is why I'm doing this. And I'm doing it for free. I got, I'm a full-time lawyer. I don't have to do this. I'm not trying to make money here. I'm not trying to steal clients. I'm just here to tell the truth. I have no agenda. So the cows and plows settlement agreements, when I first started looking at them after all of Treaty 8 was pretty much signed, I think all of Treaty 8 was signed, right? Yeah, okay. Because I, not, I, I knew they were moving them now to Treaty 4, Treaty 6, Treaty 1, Treaty 2. So I looked at the, I read the, and this one is online. You can find it online. It's called the Little Little Red River um, Cows and Plows Settlement agree, Agreement. It's online. That one's online. All of the settlement agreements that I have, that have come into my possession have always been after the fact of the settlement agreement being voted on. Because prior to that, they're confidential. So with cows and plows, they started out as treaty agriculture claims back in probably the 80s and 90s. So we've been waiting a long time for this money. And Canada knows. They underfund us in every area. They know that our people are poor. So they know that people will take this money in order to help themselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying don't take the money. What I'm upset about is the process that Canada continues to impose and dictate to us. Because did anybody from the Canadian government come to you on this on this cows and plows settlement agreement, knock on your door and say, hey, how, how should we do this? You know, you know, back the treaty was said this and this and this. Hi, Chief Donnie. Hi. You're the first, no, you're actually you're the second chief who've come to a cows and plows meeting. So thank you very much for coming. Um, so did they, anybody come knock on your door? Like, did your lawyers come knock on your door and say, hey, we should figure out this formula and figure out how we're going to pay everybody out? Did anybody come and see your community and talk about that from the government? Probably not. And you know who? You know who made up the terms of the settlement agreement? The lawyers and the Canadian government. White and this lawyers. Is white lawyers. This is why this needs to stop. It is now 2024. We need to come together because what I am facing and what I am fighting as an indigenous lawyer within the courts, I need help. Like when I'm fighting in federal court this morning against this these white lawyers and I have a white judge, they don't understand who we are. If they don't understand who we are, why are they imposing their laws on us? We need to be able to figure this out for ourselves and on our own. We need to come back to the land. We need to come back to who we are. We need to teach our children and our grandchildren because if we don't, we are not going to be able to have rights to the land. We're not going to be able to um, have our ceremonies on the land. We're not going to be able to hunt. We're not going to be able to be able to gather. We're not going to be able to pick our medicines. That's what's going to happen long term. 
you're not going to see it right away once the cows and plows is, is signed because I'm going to tell you about the specific claims process. So the specific claims process, every cows and plows um, litigation has gone from the 80s and 90s to the specific claims process um, and through the tribunal. So the Tribunal Act came out in 2007, and guess who who helped write that policy with the Canadian government? Let's take anybody want to guess who wrote who wrote the specific claims policy with the government of Canada? The AFN. The AFN, and this is on the website. Okay. So I want to tell you. There's two things within the specific claims process that has to happen that is in every settlement agreement. There is no nation out there that is excluded from these two things. It's called certainty and finality. And I'm gonna read it to you right from the Government of Canada website. You can go find it yourself, okay? Government of Canada website, specific claims. It states, federal government requires certainty and finality when it settles a claim. The claim settlement must achieve complete and final redress of the claim. So whatever is being negotiated under that settlement agreement, it, it has to address the completeness of that claim and redress, okay? First Nations must therefore provide the federal government with a release and an indemnity clause with respect to the claim and may be required to provide a surrender and litigation or take other steps so that the claim cannot be reopened at some time in the future. So what that means is that the federal government through the settlement agreements with the release clause that states, we release Canada now and forever into the future on the treaty right to agriculture benefits claim is done there we can never in the future well there's 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 I'll, i'm going to talk about um an appeal process after but i'll talk about that after but after this you can never take the federal government like your grandchildren would will never be able to sue canada again on this it's a one-time thing that's it that's all canada's offering on this and the release clause states that you release canada now and forever into the future of their fiduciary obligation to treaty the second thing is indemnity. So what that indemnity clause says is that we will save Canada harmless from future harm. So no one like, none of us can go after Canada. And the First Nation is the gatekeeper or the chief chief and council uh, who signed the settlement agreement are the gatekeeper of holding Canada harmless. So if you already see this, this settlement agreement is very lopsided. I don't think that we would I don't think that we would have negotiated such a lopsided agreement in favor of Canada. There's no way. That is why I'm saying that the settlement agreement was not developed by First Nations Indigenous people. It was imposed on us. Now, with with the release clause, every settlement agreement has uh has all, all, all of it's all of it is the same. Like you can't there, there's a new clause that came in the non-navigation, non-derogation clause of our rights, but that means nothing because really the two things that trump specific claims, the two things are release and indemnity. That's what you need to understand. If a First Nation says, Oh, we took that out and we took that out, no, don't lie. That's for certain. That's why it's called certainty and finality. That's why it's called settlement agreement. Settlement means final, done. We're done. We're done with you. Get out of here. You have no rights to your land anymore. Because when you think about the treaty right to agriculture, it just does not encompass farming. It does. You know, these young people, they need to understand it's not just about cows and plows and farming and gardening and things like that. It's about livelihood. When we signed treaty back then, that treaty right to agriculture meant livelihood because it replaced the buffalo, which was our total livelihood and survival. That's our livelihood. You put it into now, present, what that means is everything, anything. Do you think that our ancestors wanted to be like this and poor and fighting for our rights still? No. 
when they made treaty, when they made treaty with the creator and the treaty commissioner was there, they, they made that promise too on behalf of the crown. Who's breaking it? That's why we need to uphold this treaty. So every settlement agreement has a purpose. Within the purpose, it states in the purpose part of the settlement agreement. Is this your summary here? Yeah. So within the purpose clause, I, I left my paperwork. The, the purpose clause really speaks to what the settlement agreement, what you're giving up. So, so the purpose clause, it says, uh, it's to fully and finally resolve Canada's obligations to the First Nation and resolve any outstanding liability arising directly or indirectly from the treaty agriculture benefits claim. So that can, can include not only agriculture claims, like the the uh, the treaty A claims were pretty much just specific the clause to agriculture. Now they're starting to put in more clauses in the specific claims, cows and plows agreement, which is twine and ammunition. Uh, Suits and metals, hay lands, I've seen in other cases, medicine chests, I've seen in other cases, lands, arable lands that they are giving up, signing away that. So that's in, that is in the purpose of every settlement agreement. So when you have every, every band member has the right to see the settlement agreement. So that's what you see in purpose. You go read that purpose. That's what you're giving up. The next clause usually is the release clause 3.0. So that actually uh, speaks to um, claim is concluded once and for all and Canada is released from any future claims itself to its failure to provide agriculture benefits. So that's the release clause. That's in every settlement agreement. It's scary about this, this whole settlement agreement too is that not only are we signing off our rights and we're protecting Canada, we're doing it in a way that the referendum is very easy for it to happen. So under the referendum, usually under land claims, when we're doing, you know, these when we're doing land claims referendums and we have to have our vote is usually 50% plus one, right? Usually 50% plus one of the voting population votes. 50% plus one makes that decision. In the settlement agreement, it's 25%. So 25% of your voters list will make that decision. That is all the government of Canada needs to pass the settlement agreement. If it does not pass at 25%, you do a second vote. So you only have 12.5% that needs to pass the second vote. So if you think about it this way, you have 100 people, 25, 25 people will pass that. If it doesn't, if it doesn't pass on the first vote, then you have a second vote. So it'll be 13 people will pass it. So what happens to the rest of the 87% of the people that didn't have a chance? Exactly. And we can't get out of that. This is the way the settlement agreement is drafted. And within the within the settlement agreement, there is a provision for an information session. And this is when your lovely lawyer comes out to sugarcoat everything and say, okay, this is, you know, you're gonna get your money. Did you get your twenty five, thirty thousand dollars? Just have to vote yes. No, this is like economic sovereignty for us. This is treaty fulfillment. That's a bunch of crap. It's disgusting. This whole colonial patriarchy has taken over us and we have allowed it to happen. This is why the women are standing up. This is why I've stood up because I want my grandchildren and the ones not here yet to be able to have that opportunity to the land. I still want them to go somewhere where they can ceremony, where they can pick. This is ours. So the information sessions that the information, uh, there's only needs to be, a, I guess, an, a mandatory information session to the nation. And then probably they, they explain, well, they'll explain what the settlement agreement is. 
And then they'll ex it's also a cookie cutter agreement. Every settlement agreement is the same. They just take the name out, put the other First Nation name in, take out the purpose, put their purpose in, you know, take out the number for the compensation, put that in. It's very easy. And you're paying your lawyer anywhere from six to ten million dollars. So that lawyer who's taking the money off of our children's backs is going to live wonderfully while our people get twenty, thirty thousand dollars when is that? That's probably that could be spent in a day buying a vehicle. And that money that sits in the trust, the leftover money, okay, let's let's do some math here. So if we have two Janelle, you have a calculator? If we have two thousand band members, you get a hundred million dollars to say. You give twenty thousand dollars to each band member. How much is that? Twenty thousand times two thousand is forty million. Forty million. So you have sixty million left over. But probably some of that has to go to debt and loans that have already been borrowed against. That you know some lawyers are lending and shouldn't be lending. So then you're probably left with let's take another twenty million of that. So we're left 60, so that's six, we're left with $40 million to put into the trust. And that's supposed to stretch to future generations if the chief and council have it together to be able to invest properly and not spend that money. The other thing is the trust agreement, you cannot sue. So if, if the trust is not, um, if you don't spend the, the monies in, within that trust accordingly, Band members can't do anything about it. Like we can't, you can't sue the bank for negligence or misfeasance or anybody. Or that's Indian it. Affairs. Or Indian Affairs. I know this is not sitting too well with a lot of people, right? Do you agree with me? Because it doesn't sit well with me. All we hear out there is is what what kind of money is coming out. Um. So once the settlement agreement passes, because I'm pretty sure in every single community it's going to pass, and it has been. Now these Munya lawyers are out there bragging around, oh, you know, they're 80, 90% people are saying yes. Well, of course, they want the money. And right on the referendum, uh, the PCD um, referendum, I don't know, letter that you get, it will say if you do not vote yes, you will not get a PCD. So look at the language of, of these documents. It's all so that we vote yes. It is the bill of sale that Canada needs to prove to the international court that they have attained the bill of sale to our land. And they're doing it through settlement agreements. They are legislating our treaty rights into their specific claims policy. And it has to stop now. This is why we need leadership like chiefs to stand up and say no. So right now I'm, I am um, I want to talk about after the settlement agreement passes, you can bring a proceeding. It usually has to be within the 30 day period. So if your if your settlement agreement uh, passed on say March 1st, then you would have to put an appeal in through the uh, federal court on a judicial review to look at the look at it based on whatever your argument a lot of it is probably going to be consultation so i'm going to talk about consultation but in one particular case um i i, I do have a file uh that's a sister file that was already heard on a settlement agreement on cows and plows in alberta i am currently legal counsel to to one of the band members has that has taken the settlement agreement to court so my sister file has gone ahead of me she was heard on january 30th and 31st um, in front of Justice Paul Fable, who's a federal court judge, my cousin, and um, he'll decide. And that's kind of what we're waiting for. Um, my friend who is on that sister file, Orla, is also my lawyer. I had got into some stuff too, so <laughs> with uh, some things on the cows and plows, but that's because the, the government and the lawyers are trying to silence me. To say like I'm waiting I'm waiting for Canada to come and say hey you can't be talking about this because I've already had some lawyers who tried to take say you cannot talk about this and I am and I've already been threatened so I had to lawyer up so I'm good now so don't worry about me but anyways 
um, the proceeding, to go back to the proceeding. That decision should probably be coming out in about six months or less, but it's on most like it's concerning consultation because within that uh, proceeding, the only consultation or information that was given was through a Zoom call. So they didn't actually come to the nation to do a presentation, they did a Zoom call. So it's being challenged on consultation. Now, I wanna talk about consultation. You can bring a proceeding within the 30 days after settlement agreement is signed. I am taking people, I am actually taking another nation settlement agreement to court. I'm just writing up the submissions for next week. So I'm going to do my best to do what I can to plug up the court on my name with these settlement agreements. Any band member who wants to, to who wants to take this to court, let's do it. Because we're this, this is our kids' land. This is our rights. This is our rights to treaty. And we have to think about them. Now, what I would what I would say is on consultation is you have to understand fully from your legal counsel what you're giving up and what you're getting. Those are the pros and cons. You should be doing that anyway. That's what lawyers do. That's what legal advice is. Okay? I have a letter that's drafted that you can use, anybody can use, you give to your lawyer to sign your name. What is the consultation framework going to be on the loss of treaty right to agriculture? What is the framework going to be? How are you going to do this? You are also allowed, there is a loophole within the settlement agreement because it says the nation can have independent legal advice. So that means anybody in the nation can have independent legal advice is my, you know, the way I read it, the way I would interpret it. So if you want independent legal advice, get someone who knows, get, get a lawyer who knows about treaty because these Munyao lawyers, they don't care. They read a settlement agreement. They say, oh, look, fine. You guys are getting this much money. That's fantastic, fabulous. But they don't care about our rights. They don't know nothing about treaty. Like I said, when I go into federal court, they don't know nothing about treaty. So why are we allowing them to continue to tell us what to do all the time? And our leadership, they got to start standing up. What has the FSIN done? Seriously. It's lost its purpose, purpose. It's lost its vision. It's now going under forensic audit. Thank the good Lord that's going on. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not up for corruption. I don't, I don't tolerate that. Our kids are important. And that's why, that's why I'm out of pound maker. You know, there's a lot of rumors that are going out. Oh, she's just a kicked out disgruntled lawyer because we didn't want her there. No, because I don't put up with corruption and I'm a whistleblower and I started a federal investigation on Chief Dwayne Antoine, who is my uncle. And now I'm being investigated by the law society because of him. Why? Because I gave information to the RCMP? No, you don't use kids' money like that. You don't use people who are on social assistance. You don't use their money like that disgusting what have we become money is more important than the land money is more important than your your grandchildren that little girl that's sitting over there that little baby that's in my daughter's belly no i will never ever give up i will speak loud and clear and i'm going to do this but i need help and if you think that I'm wrong, that's your opinion. But I know I'm right. So if you have any questions, that is my presentation on cows and cows. You had the questions earlier, right? Yeah. yeah. Five minute break. Let's have a five minute break. Everybody needs a smoke now after that reality check. <laughs> You drink after that reality check. Get a shot. <laughs> oh, did I I'll go smoke. You know what? Smoke. Yeah. You should get up. Sure. Huh? Yeah, it's a bit too low. Ooh. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm done. It's fine. I wanted to smoke break. I didn't know I had to take my socks off because I'm in a hot flash.
Tracy, do you have the keys? I'm going to get in Bona Vico. And then we'll move to the question. So when I was talking about um, when I was talking about what, what we're finding within the settlement agreement referendums, who is when they're having referendums with First Nations, they're also passing things like election laws and citizenship laws. So within the referendum, there'll be like a little box for housing laws, there'll be a little box for either election or citizenship law. So, and on that page I was talking about, it says if you don't vote yes, you'll get to the most likely you'll vote yes for everything. So actually you're voting yes to things that you shouldn't be voting yes on. So there's some of the lawyers are being really sneaky and some councils are being really sneaky like that too. For example, up north, which I think we didn't, uh, like I can't talk about this because it is public information. But up at New Lake, they have about 2,400 band members and then they wrote uh, their citizenship or membership law. And now it excludes um, it excludes band members, so the, the band members that vote now are the only ones that live on reserve. So I think it's about 700 people. So they went from 2400 to 700 for voting. So that's when they did their settlement agreement, their voting list was only 700. So it excluded that many other people, which was 700 minus 1700. Okay. Hello, 1700 people weren't included within that housing council. So those kinds of things are happening where now First Nations are making their membership codes or laws to exclude their own people that were on the voting list in the first place and they're taking them off. And then they're telling them, oh, well, now you've got to make an application to get back into the back. It makes no sense. So these are these the key players. Um, and I just wanted to let you guys know that, that we, this is also happening within housing files. It's very, very, very easy. The lawyers are fighting over clients. It's, it's pretty sad, but I think Rachel wanted to finish and touch up on something where she needed questions. Did anybody have any questions? Go ahead. I don't really hear anything from them either, and quite frankly, the chiefs don't like me, so I never get invited to those kinds of things. But no, I, I don't know if there's been anything actually. I haven't heard anything, heard anything that's going on. So no, I, I don't. It is their mandate. So why are we, you know, like sometimes I think we've got a question, why are we even part of these organizations that take money from us, but they don't do nothing for us. And that's really what that is. You know, they, they could have warned you and said, hey, we're going to put about a consultation framework to help each nation to, to better understand this process because it's a really hard process. Did everybody hear the question? What is the purpose of the FSI and the AFN? They should have warned us on what was coming and they didn't. That's their journal. is basically what he said, and I agree. And then my comment back is what are we doing with those kind of organizations? When you can move separately, it's not hard. They've got it. And we probably make their way from the FSI and the AFN, but they went back. But all those monies were going to be directed to the nation. All those monies are the FN and the FSA and part of your nation, but it's your nation. They don't have to go to them. Any other questions? Not hard. Um, I was trying to answer that question too. Um, before uh, in uh, 1993, or 1993, 1992, when Orbit Murphy was the national chief 
the last time the AFN was trying to fight with the federal government. Since then, when Phil Fontaine got in, Phil Fontaine is the one who made the Indian residential school process. And that's where they kept the first money for 300000 There have been chiefs or the AFN that are, they're not, uh, they're not arguing with us, they're more like Indian agents. If they disagree with Trudeau or Harper, they don't get any money. So they disagree. So that's what they've been doing over there. What's happening over there? So what should be done too is that the treaties, the money to come in for the treaties, so a treaty for the community, to communities. That money has never been given to our people or to our communities. So why are we going through a specific claims policy? Again, we've been uh, trying to Canada write that specific claims policy or they participated. So they're the ones who are capping that at 150 million. Uh, what we've been doing is looking at that critically and saying, instead of going through specific claims policy, where's the treaty implementation budget? Where's the money to implement the things from treaties that people never got. That's what the uh, AFN should be doing. But if you look at the AFN structure, AFN 600 chiefs, uh, 300 of these chiefs, no treaties. So AFN likes to do things for BC chiefs who have nothing. And then they, they find them, so they overlook the treaty chiefs. Uh, um, that's why the Prairie Treaty Nation Alliance PTNA started years ago. If the treaty chiefs broke away from AFN, because AFN was uh, helping chiefs or helping uh, reserves that didn't have treaties. And the whole reason that Canada is Canada is because of the treaties. There's no Canada, there's no treaties. So the treaty people, the people who sign treaties, the international treaties, we're the ones with the strongest voice, we're the ones with the most power. But right now, they're, they're taking that power away. This is one way this uh, taking on uh, the treaty right to the that's put it under specific claims policy that's capped. Instead, what our leaders should be arguing for is like, for there's, re there's really reconciliation that Trudeau talks about. Then where's the treaty money into perpetuity? Where's the money forever for treaty implementation? And we should be arguing for that money and not even talk about specific claims policy. The government comes and says, you have to pick another specific claim that you say no. We'll take another implementation that the money should go. They have to be able to understand that what's the difference between specific claims that EFA has set up and what's the difference between our leaders being sovereign leaders standing up and saying, well, we're not going to take that. Who's not going to take that? They have to know the difference. Somebody has to, uh, the technicians or the lawyers or whoever's helping them, have to help their team. That's the better way to go. That's not happening. Here's the things critically. We haven't done that for maybe uh, at least 10 years now. We look at anything we can is doing with a critical eye and warn us. They just grow along because they have a lot of money too. You have a question you need to hear? There's no way that they can know. Uh, there's problem the problem the 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 um, I think what the Senators are saying is correct. We look at the 633 nations across Canada. Each one of us is a sovereign nation. Each one of us, whether it's uh, Low Time Town Maker, uh, Stony Dakota, uh, you know, Alexis, Sadly, every single one of these uh, First Nations is sovereign or they're standing on their own. But what happens is that we are the ones in historic treaties, Treaty 2011. We made an agreement with Great Britain. We signed an international treaty with Great Britain up here. 
but what um, and then Canada is down here. And so Canada has been trying to like link up and tell us what to do. And we've been standing up here saying you can't because we signed a great one. That's what Sal is talking about. But you know, there's things that are happening like the UNDRIP bill that was coming into Canada. The UNDRIP, my minister Hedberg said the UNDRIP was good in 2007 or will follow it as an inspirational document. That means we'll kind of look at it, but it doesn't really mean anything. That's what Harper said in 2000, 2007. Since then, she Indigenous or Indians like Mary Ellen Jabell, they all agreed to pass uh, the UNDRIP into Bill C-15 that becomes uh, when they took our international treaties and they put them under Canada. So then our treaties become domesticated. So then we're no longer nation. We're not even nations like little tiny species. Down and right of Great Britain. What they've done is they put that down, and it's now little pine signs in Canada. That's where Canada is reading it now. And so when Canada says that, they put you under their legislation, then they're saying, well, you have to follow this sort of claims policy because you're domesticated now. Which is, you know, during the there was, there was a lot of uh, people fighting about this on, we were fighting online, mostly with Russ Dibel. There are a few lawyers, or First Nation lawyers, who were looking at this and saying, this is not going to be good. But everybody in the communities probably heard of this thing that they thought that was going to be a really good thing. Not a good thing for us. Probably a good thing for the BC Indians again, because they have no treaties, and they want to push their inherent rights. But for us, the Treaty First Nation, we have to, our, our position is strong, always. And so, well, so everything is right. It's a nation to nation. But since then, what's happened is that that nation to nation agreement has been whittled down to so that right now we're in a nation to state. Now, we, uh, the First Nations, our governments and organizations, we're negotiating with uh, the state of Canada now. They pulled us down. And even that's something, you know, we, um, when I, we talked yesterday in. Saskatoon, and I gave everybody a quick history of 1969. Right for uh, the organization started up, National Indian Brotherhood, FSIN, uh, Indian Association of Alberta, Union of Alberta, Union of BC Chiefs. All these organizations started to get money and to lobby for their First Nations or for the for the tribes or the people within their provinces. That all happened around uh, from the 70s until the 80s until recreation of the Constitution, 1981-1982. And then what happened from there is that there was supposed to be first minister offices. So our chiefs were supposed to sit with Trudeau then, and like John Kutchian and whoever, Lawheed, whoever the premiers were, they were to sit down with the white premiers and see what self-government is, what our laws are. That's the nation-to-nation -nation relationship. But uh, what Canada did then is Canada, like the Bill C-31, when they come to the uh, protests, and they spent the next three years, uh, there will be one more time to a mic saying, I'm going to kick off my van, blah, 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 blah. And then the kids get home, and they didn't kick you off. None of them kick you off. Your, your, your gripe or your, your budget with Canada, not us. They, that didn't smoke. They kept doing that for three years. They ran out the time when our leaders had a chance got directly to um, Canada to make some kind of agreement. There are four first ministers in the Canadian Constitution. Um, after um, Section 25, Section 35, there was a series of first ministers' conferences. It, it didn't go anywhere, and then since then, there have been things, you know, that we see. To come back to that self government table and make a deal with First Nations, but it's been unsuccessful. So there's there's a lot of history, there's a lot of uh, legislation, a lot of things that are happening uh, that have happened for our people, but we, we don't get the 
we don't get the information and our kids, we don't get the education and our kids don't get the information. So they don't know how hard our leaders fought or how hard our leaders were fighting up until 1982 or up until 1990. And one other thing I wanted to mention on that trust. Um, so my band is uh, Sony. We're three bands over there. Three plus two feet with Sony. And they, we had uh, we had oil and gas. And my dad set up a trust heritage trust fund, two hundred and fifty million in that trust fund. And so when we wanted to do things on the reserve, like if we needed a one of those Pasco trailers for a, a class, like grade two class, is too big, so you need a trailer, or for the upgrading, or for something, you know, some year they put more money in for all the um, they're changing the septic tanks or doing something. Every time the band told Ottawa. We want this more money in this area or this area. Ottawa would tell our people, uh, you have a trust for 250 million, use that. So it's like, even if you try to save that money, you try to do something, because that money was to be saved for seven generations for the kids to have. And Ottawa, that's all they did. They're just like a spoiled kids thing. Use that money, use that money, use that money. Because they don't want us to have anything. They don't want us to go forward seven generations. They want us to be an Indian. That's what's been going on in the, uh, in the uh, right now with First Nations and with, uh, with Canada. But there are people, like, then there are people who are analyzing, and there are people who are looking at this, and we're putting that information out to our people. We are doing that work, but uh, it's, a, it's the difference between uh, who are you looking at? Letting people know and that they understand it and that they want to do something about it. A lot of people are, and I get it too. A lot of people are too, uh, they're too busy to, you know, get gas money, get, get money for diapers and milk, uh, feed their kids, pay a bill, have internet. Like, I, I know I'm on the reserve too. I don't have a vehicle too. So I know what the struggle is like on reserve. So it's really hard to try to educate our people when there's so many other things that we're we're dealing with, wellness, addictions and families, um, or just a lot of things that our people are dealing with, trauma, hurt, you know, we need to healing in our communities, lateral violence. We've seen a lot of lateral violence since we started doing this. Um, but there's, we know there's problems, but we still have to, at the end of the day, I believe that, uh, that we the creator. I believe that we were placed here for a reason. I believe that uh, when we have our prayers, the things that we see, the things that have saved us for ten thousand years, the things that have made us, that's going forward. That's that's what I think. So um, I believe for this time, yeah, uh, that has gone out, and. Uh, I don't know what the consolation process will be for our people. Um, if there is going to be anything, I would like to see a copy of the settlement agreement that was sent out. And uh, I remember how one meeting here I came, and uh, the, uh, there were lawyers here. And I don't remember what it was that I asked. But my husband also said no. It was decided that we're not, you know, not doing this. So um, I need I, I am requesting copies of those uh, that proposed settlement agreement to be, you know, given to uh, to be made available to membership, and. Uh, I would like to get a copy of a form for consultation process that uh, that I can apply to the lawyers, send to the lawyers, so that I can, uh, you know, the lawyers can uh, um, write on there, write and tell us, are they, is there going to be a consultation process? Without letting us know. Um, What's the other thing I was going to ask? Um, but I, I, that's one thing I'm going to do is that consultation. We need to have that. Um, and once we, I see a copy of this uh, settlement agreement, 
I if that clause is on there, what do we do? So the question is, or a comment, I guess, is that um, Lillian made that she wants to see the offer, right? The, uh, I don't, but I don't think you guys have an offer yet, okay? Like a formal offer. Were you, were you come, did you, yeah, it's just a verbal offer at this point. You guys have no letter of offer yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, is what I just talked to two people. And we do have a right. And, um, I prefer to see the settlement agreement. So that's also one of the things that she asked is to see the settlement agreement. And every band member should have copies because you know it impacts everybody, right? So everybody has a right to see the settlement agreement. And the third thing she talked about is the release clause and there what we do about it. Well, it's really up to you at the end of the day because there's nothing that you can do to take out the release clause or indemnity clause. They did put, I, which I forgot to talk about, was the non derogation, non aggregation clause, which is usually in the latter part of the settlement agreement. I think the one that I just see most, most recently within the last so many months is um, around section 14 of the settlement agreement. But that, that, um, that clause states that, um, that this agreement shall not be construed so as to abrogate, derogate, or otherwise alter in the way the existing aboriginal and treaty rights of the First Nation as recognized and affirmed by treaty, and in this case, and Section 35 of the Constitution Act. In other words, this agreement cannot alter the treaty rights of this nation or its members in any way. But that doesn't matter. They can put all the flowery language in there all they want that are right there to be impacted. I don't worry, I read it word by word. So my interpretation is on that, they're talking about other true rights, which could be right to hunt. But pretty soon, that's not going to happen. Guaranteed. The FSAM has already signed, as it was back in 2018, Rachel, when they signed that MOU. Uh, the uh, FSAM signed a MOU with the province to allow the Chihuahua to come on to our land. So that, you know, that's already a breach. I tried to tell Bobby that, but he doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. And this is the whole reason why you guys, we need to read these agreements. So you can't just let them, especially white lawyers, to read them because they don't understand our rights. So guarantee your question to that is going to be in there. Now, really, at the end of the day, when she's asking about a consultation framework and asking the lawyers about it, the lawyers are going to say, well, the information session is your consultation. It's up to the members to provide that consultation framework. I can help you with that. How do we start the board on even helping to form a better doing? What does that Guide you guys through that if you had wanted that. Um, because my grandchild's going to be stuck there, I think. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, it, it's a process that has to be done by the band and by the can it up to your lawyers to do it because they're not going to do it the way that it should be done. And I think it's a process that should be happening now already, like this discussion that we're having here. Like we need to start talking about treaty and the kids need to be here and listening to it. They need to be listening to what treaty is all about, right? Because if they don't, they don't know who, you know, they don't know who they are. They don't have that. They don't understand that connection to the land. Realize that a lot of our people are caught up in addictions 
but you know what? Enough is enough. We can't be stuck in our trauma. We got to move past that trauma and we can't allow that, that trauma to take power over us anymore because we want our children to become good leaders so that their children will have rights the way that we have rights because the way it's the way it's going and for our leadership to just roll over and say oh no we can't do anything about it we're going to lose treaty anyway well you know what when we all die we're going to meet creator and we're going to meet our ancestors and we're going to meet our grandchildren are we going to say that we upheld treaty for them or are we going to say that we said yes and for that $20,000 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. But the point is, as Canada is trying to take our land away, where are you going to be able to do that when you have the land? We don't have the land because what's happening is they're enforcing taxation onto us. We're becoming municipalities. What's going to happen is they're already First Nations. I, I, I totally agree with you th with that. There's just no way they're ever going to take that away from us. But the point is that the land and that our connection to the land and able to support those things that we do. Because already in Manitoba, I'm already hearing from band members with certain bands that their, their status card, they can't get tax exemption with it anymore with their nation anyways. It's no good. They can't get tax-free gas or tax-free smokes. It's happening. They're, they're putting into their, with especially bands who have, it's it, it's been a series of blows to treaty along the way. Okay, example, I gave you the MOU on FSIN. You know, pretty soon what's going to happen, they, they have that right to come on. Now they have that right to come onto our land because of that. So they're, they're slowly chipping away at absolutely everything we do, right? And pretty soon in the future, everything's going to, they're, they're, the, the, the government of Saskatchewan is selling crown lands off right now as we speak. And who's saying anything about it? Nobody, absolutely no one. You know what? I was in. I have. I was dealing with this a couple of years ago with the government of Saskatchewan on crown lands, and no leaders are saying anything about it. Well, I think FSI had put a media release out about it. But what are we really doing? What are you doing? We all have to take our responsibility to what and who we are, and that is our connection to the land. It's going to be hard for those ones that are coming up, let me tell you that. And if we're just going to roll over and say, okay, well, let's just let the government do what they want to do. They've been doing it to us for the last 150 years. Let's just give up. Well, then why am I here? Aside from what we are doing right now, what can I, as an individual member, do to help us? Educate. Yeah. Educate people. That is the key here. Educate. Our kids aren't learning it in the schools. Are they learning it in Little Pine School? Yeah, yeah, the question I had, are we teaching the great No, wow. probably not. Probably not. Back in 2007, the, uh, the Saskatchewan government mandated that treaties be taught in the classroom, and there was nobody doing it. So back in 2010, I got hired on as a consultant with the Living Sky School Division, so that's in North Battleford. I worked for the school division. I trained the administrators, so all the administrators in the schools and the teachers on treaties. I actually wrote a whole website on treaties and residential schools and everything that impacts us. That's called the Living Sky School Division Treaty Right to Education, Treaty 6 Education website. It's still there, very simple to read. If your kids aren't learning it at school, go on there with them. There's actually lessons on there. I actually developed a game um, with Mr. Website, we developed a game like uh, it was similar to that Oregon Trail back in the day with the first computer where you'd go hunting or if you didn't hunt anything, your people would die. So your family would die or you'd get disease or whatever. Remember that game? So I developed a game like that. Um, but we actually traveled through Treaty 6 territory. So the kids actually learned that they lived in Treaty 6 and then they learned every nation and then they learned certain parts of the treaty through those questions, right? 
So that is how we need to like you need we need to teach them on to be on the land. We you know somewhere there's this gap, and that gap happened because of all of the trauma that has happened from res especially residential schools. That shame that we live in is not our shame. That's Canada's shame. We're a very powerful, resilient people. I remember in the summertime, I went to go uh, tour the Battle of Little Bighorn. And those young people that uh, gave us the tour on the land and how, you know, how they uh, beat Custer, those people, like the way they spoke, those young people, they just know so much about their history and who they are. There's so much history here in your nation. We need to be proud of who we are once again, because it's not that way. So really, this whole consultation framework is going to be up to you. It's going to be up to you guys to get it together to establish what you want to do and how you're going to address it. How is the money going to be spent? How much money are you going to get per capita? How much money is going to go into the trust? What are What is the trust going to be for? Who are going to be the trustees? Like, this is a lot of work. You're not, you know, like you have a lot of work to do that's ahead for your nation on this. But number one, educate yourselves on it. Go on to the specific claim, go on to the Government of Canada website, search up specific claims. You'll find the information there. Go on to the internet and search up settlement agreements. You'll for sure find a little Red River one up there. There's a lot of settlement agreements that are coming out now. So they're all the same. You can't change them whatsoever. You can't change that process. It is what it is. Canada will not move on it at all. Did I answer your question? So uh, I have a question. It just seems like to me, the way I understand it is that um, cows and plows is going to the government is gonna take our land. We'll have no rights. So do we just scrap that whole thing? That whole cows and plows? I would say so. Yeah, that's, that's how I understand it. That's how I understand it. It's not the process, either you do it or you don't. you don't. Yeah. So if we develop a, let's say a cows and plows working committee, strictly work on that we make sure there's a consultation process um there's make sure we have trust funds established trust funds for our future of our children we look at the trust agreement the clauses that say that you know we don't want to lose our treaty to the land but that's not possible so why go through all the whole process and do that you should probably um, tell your lawyer to come here and do a presentation for you. These questions that you're asking me, asking, I've done it. Like, in Poundmaker Maurice came to see us, and I asked the same thing. I have my videos up on TikTok if you want to watch them when I question your lawyer. Yeah, yeah, we could use the same paper and not lose this sand for a thousand years from us now. Only one little piece of paper. We could do that. He could do that. He could set a precedent right now. See, but right now, but can't even do nothing. They can't even take that land, their own land. We the one one piece of paper. That's all we need to write. If Donnie could write down one piece of paper, thousand years, we got to get the sum them a ski. Then that secures the future of our children. All it takes is one signature. Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure we could have. Uh, no, but for us, our safety net. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but look at the, uh, how come we, how could, uh, why, how come yeah, we, how, stay, numbers. Or how come they can't kick out Randy? He has a hundred year lease on that store. 
Yeah, pick up that paper. No, really, seriously, that's, that's your guys' land. land. No, that's mosquitoes' land. Now that's a different story. Oh, but, sorry, yeah. See, but it all it takes is a paper for him to write down, and nobody could touch him. Why can't we do the same? Yeah. You're touching him. No, not oh, ours, but our own paper. So nobody, no future chief can sell out and all that. You could write one now. I'm pretty sure you that's, will. Uh, that's, 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 that's better. better. Like, that's, that's, like, like, that's like kind of like, like I, what, what I was saying. saying. Why, why do why why do our claims, claims have to fall under this, under this uh, specific, uh, specific land, land claims? claims? Why, why do the cows and wells have to fall under there? We can ask Trudeau that. We can say that to Trudeau. They can, they can just say, oh, well, because that's what everybody Treaty 8 agreed or whatever. But we're not Treaty 8. You know, it's Treaty 6. Treaty 6 chiefs argue this, the strongest for cows and plows at the time of the treaty. Because then at that time, I think it was uh, a tactical chief. The chiefs that were there, that were sitting there, knew that the buffalo were going and they wanted something. They wanted something in place. That's like a legal argument. That's something that you can argue as treaty six. But he's right too at the same time. It's better if you have a few chiefs that are saying it, saying that we this is what we want to do. Either take it out of specific claim, you change it to treaty implementation claim. Then it becomes we get that money annually every year now until forever because that's what you owe us. That, but you have to be able to make that argument. You have to be able to know when the lawyers say, "Oh well, uh, you can't do this because uh, this uh, perpetuity." Yeah, and when the lawyers are talking like that, that you, have you have to be able to um, stop the lawyers from uh, like going over your heads or trying to tell you how to think differently. That's the thing that has to be done, and that's why you know there's there's a there's people that we have that are technicians that are trying to help. Uh, chiefs and councils understand this and writing for them and trying to help so that we don't lose out on these things. Because uh, you're right, if you go through the whole process and uh, the consultation, everything, and do everything right, uh, at the end of it, it's still, um, Canada's not going to change on that. Um, release them and release them from liability. The other thing is I, I'm wondering why, because there's so many things happening right now. The day school, the day scholar, uh, cows and plows, the water, uh, they seem to be making a sign off on a lot of things right now. And as well, I don't know if you, anybody knows this, but you know, Safeway got taken over by Shell. It's like an oil and gas company that's running Safeway now. So if an oil and gas company is moving from uh, resources to food and our food prices are going up, what is that, you know, what's happening? Uh, should we doing, should we be doing community gardens and doing more things for our food sovereignty for to protect our people in our communities, keeping the places where our medicines are growing or um, making sure that we're not, that we're making sure that those areas are marked as sacred places or things. There's a lot of things to think about. And the other thing, you know, how you were saying, well, we could pretend to have consultation and maybe go four or five years. I think that's a good idea because maybe in four or five years, our young people coming up will be more skilled, um, more skilled in solar development, more skilled in uh, IT or technical work. We need that help too. So I think that, that you know, as a community, if you think like that, uh, not just to only delay or whatever, but also to empower your people and get those, Get that strength back and that's what we did long ago everybody had a role in the community that's that's what we're trying to go back to and that's why we're going around trying to remember trying to remind our our people how our bands or how our clans work together and that's that's how we were very strong but now you know everybody kind of standing out there on their own um that's what's hurting us no bands wanting to share information or or uh, stand together that's what hurting us so anyhow 
Are there any more questions? No. I thought I was good. I thought I was winding it down. Let's get to see this guy over here. Here. <laughs> that nowadays uh, these chiefs are not really well looked into by the government. So I always ask myself, to ask somebody, maybe have you guys sat, sat with lifetime chiefs or hereditary chiefs? And if that's the way to go, what's the process? Well, well that's all. Well, um, uh, She'll tell you the history, but uh, in my in my family, the hereditary chief's family was in was in our family, and I think that's why I'm doing this now, not because I'm elected, and not because I'm a leadership in my community, but I am in leadership because that's the role of my family was given uh, to Clay. So no matter, it doesn't matter if I'm a um, doesn't matter if I'm not elected or, you know, when the floods came through Calgary and water spilled everywhere into Morley, six of God, all our, our, all our lands got flooded. We were the first ones down there. I think we're in vests and helping the people, uh, set up, uh, food banks and, and doing things like that. Just cause, uh, that's just, that's just how we are. And we did speak to, uh, Jimmy Ochis is, uh, one of the last hereditary chiefs up by Hinton, never took treaty. Uh, we did speak to him just last week. We were talking to him about um, we were talking to him about treaty, and he was the one who reminded us about our own uh, indigenous or our own First Nation treaties with each other, two thousand bands, and uh, looking at the two row wampum and the great great law of peace. That's he reminded us about those things that we have bigger picture treaties. The biggest picture treaty is not our agreement with the white people. The biggest picture treaty is our agreement with creator, all of us, with each other. That That's where our focus should be. But because we haven't been taught that or we're not reminded, everybody who talks, especially young people nowadays, 25 and under, when you talk to them about treaty, they're going to say right away, my treaty rights, my education rights, my this, my, mine. It's not theirs. They're, if they have they if they have a right, it's because they're part of a band, because they're part of a people. That's why they have something. But if they're just you know standing out there making a lot of trouble and not helping their band, then they shouldn't have any rights, because that the the whole reason that we have something is because we're part of our people. The way I was brought up, if I could write, if I could speak, that's not for me to go off to Hollywood or. APTN, I guess, and uh, make a lot of money. Uh, I have to stay in my community and help my people. And that's humbling. That's, uh, you know, if I don't have a job or something, I have to try to do things to, to get myself to work. But that's, uh, that's the role. The hereditary leadership or the traditional leadership is still in our communities. They're the ones that have the treaty stories. They're some of the traditional people or the medicine people. They're still in the communities. Otherwise, we wouldn't have some of the things that we have. You were going to say your role or your hereditary role or tradition. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, like, I don't know. I've, 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 I've always had a real, like, strong sense of treaty, you know, growing up. Um, because my great-grandmother, well, my chapad was Mary Pimi, and she was married to Big Bear's youngest son, horse child. So, you know, being... Um, you know, being in her presence and being able to be, you know, hear hear her stories and being taught by her was um, probably the most profound, honorable, privileged things that I've ever, I wish I would have listened more when I was that young. But um, she really has taught me who I am and where I come from and that I don't forget. And this is what I've passed on to my own children and what I want my children to pass on to their children. And she was a matriarch within the community. Like she had the last word. Like they were, there are stories of when the leadership would go and see her and, you know, there'd be a decision that had to be made. And she was the one who said if this was the right decision or not. So this is why we need to go back to those matriarchal societies and our roles actually as our responsibilities and our roles. Um, we've taken on this patriarchal capitalist system as ours which is not ours we have to go back to who we are 
And really it's the women who are starting to stand up and say, okay, what is good for our home and what is good for our community? And that needs to happen. And us women, we need to stand together because we have a responsibility to, to our children and responsibility on top of that to the land because of our children. So we need our men to be warriors and take on their traditional responsibility and be warriors and protect us and help us. So these are the things that we need to go back to because the current system has not worked for us for the last 156, seven years. Has it? No, it hasn't. That's why we need to take control of our destinies. So if there's no more questions. No, there was a question. Is there one more question? Any more questions? How the government tries to um, keep us from succeeding. I've ordered some products from Blackfeet uh, Health Products recently, and the guy that I talked to, I said I can e-transfer you some money, and or I can use my visa. I wanted to use my. He said he, the government does not allow us to use those pathways for for us to get payment. I have to get a direct uh, from my debit directly into, so they're, that's what they're doing also so that we don't succeed in business. They're not allowing um, customers to pay through Visa or PayPal. They won't do that, the government, because uh, the Blackfeet health products say that they're a sovereign nation and they have this business, but they um, won't give anything to the government. And they refuse. So that's just an example of what the government is doing to us when we're trying to um, create a business. Yeah, that's, you know, that's where we had like traditionally like prior because of how we had our own forms of political, social, trading, commerce systems in place. So, you know, when she's talking about that trade and commerce, there, there should, should be, be no, no tax, tax levied against, against it. It, it, is, the, it, it is the government, government that, that, that is enforcing on these businesses, businesses to pay tax, tax if, it, if it crosses provincial, provincial boundaries or uses provincial means like transportation, right? You look at just recently in the news, I think it's the Musqueam ban right in Vancouver. They're building, a, I think, 122 floor high rise. And all the Munyaw up there are mad. They're mad because the Indian's getting ahead over there. Well, we should make them even more mad. Build this two high rises. Build two. <laughs> no, but for real, like this is this is the point. Like they they want to keep us where we're at, and they use policy and they use their law against us. It's time for us to say no. Look, it, and this is what I was doing when I was back in town maker. This is what I was doing. I was actually working on a on a confidential. I'm going to talk about it. I was talking about the treaty right to education agreement where everybody's signing into the regional education agreements, that's another breach of treaty. They're, in, they're making First Nations sign into the regional education agreements, which are 10-year agreements. So in 10 years, they're done. You got to look after your own funding. And if you don't spend that money properly within those 10 years, that money that you didn't spend properly after they audit you, you pay back to the government of Canada. It's bullshit. This nation that already signed a 10-year REA agreement said, hey, they already signed it. Could you review this and come and tell our chief and counsel what we did? I said, no. There's no way I'm going to come and tell you what you did because you sold your people out. You sold your kids out. Good thing they have a casino, so hopefully that's going to supplement their future. So, you know, like, you got to think about these things that, that we're signing away on. Like, you really, really need to have lawyers, especially who Indigenous lawyers who know our rights. And we're we're actually better lawyers than the non-indigenous lawyers. Like I don't know why uh, bands go and would rather consider you know non-indigenous lawyers who don't know our rights. They don't know who we are. They don't live on the reserve. They come here what maybe once a year. You know you got to really think about who you're hiring for your legal counsel too. So it's it's uh, it's 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 problematic. Like it's. It, <laughs> no, I already have. Shorty is too much work. She's driving us crazy. I drive these guys crazy. Too much work. Yes. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I just yes. ask you, what's the Indian app? Oh, Lord. 
Uh, this is Rachel's uh, area. <laughs> um, so uh, 1876, so prior to uh, Upper Canada, this is just all white man history that I'm telling you. Uh, so prior to Canada becoming Canada, there's Upper Canada, Lower Canada, they had a series of legislations, Enfranchisement Act, uh, Gradual Civilization uh, Act. They had acts that talked about uh, what, you know, kind of like what the Americans were doing to the American Indians. Canada was kind of copying those those same acts and they had acts everywhere. And so at, uh, when they started to come west and they had to make treaties with the uh, with the Indians as they came west or with the First Nations or with the, I like to say the original people. With the original people, when they came west and they had to make treaties with us, they had all these acts that were all over the place. So they combined them into one act and they call that act the Indian Act. But they started their historic treaties like in 18... 1874, 1875, 1876, they were signing the historic treaties already. But the Indian Act was written in 1876. That's the same year that they signed treaty number six. So they already had a piece of legislation that was gonna start to tell you how to live your lives while they were signing treaty. So again, Canada is uh, two-faced. Canada's lying. Canada is uh, trying to always give us the bad end of the deal. But in order to fight Canada, we have to know that. We have to know what the dates were, what they were doing, why they did this, so that when we stand there and we fight with Canada, we can tell them, oh no, this is what you did. And this is why this is why it's egregious. I don't like to use the big words, but you have to. You have to stand there and you have to use the white man words and fight with them and tell them why they're wrong and tell them why um, why our ways or why our people, the way we think is better. But the Indian Act is just a, is just a legislation, like you had said earlier when we were outside, a piece of legislation, they constantly can um, change that legislation because it's Canada's act. And right now what they're trying to do is they're trying to get rid of everything that there is under the Indian Act, like elections, we have our own First, Na First Nation Elections Acts now. We have Bill C-92, uh, Child Welfare, because they're moving Child Welfare out from under the Indian Act, Section 88, uh, where they're trying to get us to get away from the lands areas, reserve, reserve lands areas by getting into First Nation Land Management Act. They're moving us away from the Indian Act. It's subtle, or they're doing it. We're just not seeing it. But they are moving us away from the Indian Act. Pretty soon, like our treaties, the Indian Act is going to have nothing in there. Only thing it's going to have in there is um, taxation and lands reserved for Indians because they've been moving pieces of that into other legislation, like uh, the UNDRIP I was talking about, Bill C-15, the uh, UNDA or the uh, CANDRIP bill, we call it. They're moving things out. They're moving things away from the Indian Act so that they just fall under Canada or the provinces. And we're not even paying attention to what's happening. And again, that's the job of um, AFN, the policy people, or FSIN, somebody in there who's a watcher or the gatekeeper is supposed to be watching the, the legislation and looking at that critical analysis and telling us, hey, 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 this is happening. You know, it's like the scouts or the people we used to have long ago who warned us. But Everybody's in there like uh, they just are Indian Affairs uh, agents. They just have a job and they get their pay and they go home. And they're just like, we don't, we're not going to tell anybody about that. We're not going to tell anybody that there's a, a problem in that area. So that's happening too. But I'm glad you brought it up because um, people don't always know what the Indian Act is. Yeah. And yes, you're correct. We are not Indians, but from the PNA Act that was made in Great Britain in 1867, that is the term they use for us um, Indians. It's a legal term. It's still in the Canadian, still in the Canadian books. I don't have a problem. I still use the term Indian because I know it's Canadian white man legal term. And instead of getting mad about being called an Indian and a savage, I'm just going to take that and say, yeah, okay, that's what I am. Because then they, they can't do anything to me after that. <laughs> yes. Are there any more questions? You want, oh. you want to say something? She just didn't say anything. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, I just got the 
She needs a mic. What I hear or, or what I have to come at is, is um, the government is legislating. The government is legislating our, our uh, treaty right to agriculture claims. It's now specifically, and that's a way for them to, you know, chip away at our rights to our land. That's how I understand it. So now I caught it from uh, um, Rachel that the way to go is treaty implementation process, but it's not here yet. Our leadership need to work towards that. And our chief plus other chiefs, can we form a group to support our chief to move forward that way? And what you said, is to delay the process, maybe five years, maybe, you know, but we need to stop this cows and cows because we don't want to lose our land. Yeah, right. So this is That's what we need to do. This is what is not very good. Yeah. And Deanna yeah, uh, is going to explain a, a, a little bit about what nations he's working for and then it's doing that. Yeah, I, I want to go back to that when I was talking about the Canada Regional Education, education Agreement. So they're going to take out that treaty right to education now. So, so in Poundmaker, I was actually working on treaty implementation with the federal government on treaty implementation on education. So what I had did is I put together uh, a needs assessment team. So actually experts in different areas on it. It doesn't just pertain to education. Education to us is lifelong learning. We're always learning. Right, we're we're never not learning. To the white man, it's like whatever, like K to twelve, and then university, right? But under the government, um, you know, everything is capped under education, especially for post secondary. So the the model that we were trying to implement in Powermaker was based on a two stream model. One was funding, and one was curriculum. So we put everything under. Uh, under the stream of funding. So it included housing, it including infrastructure, roads, everything. I had experts in every area, mental health supports to help with trauma. Um, what else did I have? I had, an, I had an education team that sat with our elders and our students who brought out these stories so we can build our own curriculum in Poundmaker. So this was my team. So the point of that was, was I built this team because we were entering into an agreement to implement on the treaty right to education from birth to death. So the needs assessment team was there to assist in providing us with what we wanted. What did we dream about for education for our people? Well, one of the things that we were jumped about was having a facility, a school that would accommodate young mothers or pregnant mothers and then that would go all the way from K to 12. And then we would have like a technical school or access to university within a building and then a multi-purpose facility also for our elders to use so that they can also partake in whatever, you know, you maybe want to take a computer class or you want to learn about selling crypto online. I don't know, but you know, those types of things and, and an abattoir we are trying to build as well because we did have the meat shop. I don't know if that's going anywhere in Poundmaker, but. But you know, those kinds of things so that our whole nation would be able to benefit on a treaty right to education. It just wasn't limited just to K to 12. So that was what I was working on with the federal government. Now we were this close to signing the MOU to move forward on a five-year uh, a five-year um, agreement to get to that point. So what we were doing was we were building a business case model to go to Treasury Board. But the point is, is that we weren't able to get there because the nation has to be in good financial standing and Poundmaker wasn't. And this is where I was trying to straighten things out because I was doing this for our kids. I don't give a shit about anybody else. I care about the kids and no one was gonna get in the way of the kids, right? Those are who are important. They're gonna look after us. You, we're trying to raise model, good leaders and be role models for our children. So this is where it stopped because Poundmaker wasn't in a position to be in a good financial standing and they never were or wanted to at that point. So at that point, 
I had to leave this behind, but this was a model of treaty implementation. Now, the government said, okay, now that we're doing this, you cannot tell any other nation that we're implementing treaty fulfillment on education for power of attorney. So the, it is a possibility when we talk about treaty implementation. It just has to be a different route. It can't be under the legislated um, laws of Canada and policies like specific claims. So I am working with a nation right now, um, actually who want to have a community consultation framework because what the leadership has said is that if our name, if we have to sign off on a settlement agreement, we want every band member to sign off on their name to say that they're not going to sue us because you can't. Band membership can sue chief and council, they can sue Canada. Okay? So I said, well, to protect yourself, if these people are, if your band members are going to vote yes, you make them sign to say that they are not going to sue you, that they did this full and clear with consultation after we're done consultation. Because at the end of the day, on the settlement agreement, those signatures on the settlement agreement come from your chief and council. That is your chief and council's legacy. So when their grandchildren and your grandchildren look back and see those names on that settlement agreement, that's who settled. That's who sold us out. No, oh, they're they're agents of the crowd. They're agents of Canada. They don't they don't have to put up with that. They don't have to. No, 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 no excuses. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, look, we were just talking about this. Uh, in 1969, did our chiefs take it? No. In 1969, when Trudeau said, there's a white paper and we're going to be shutting you down next year. Did, the, did our chiefs just roll over? No. They pull a Perry Bell guard and take no. whatever? They didn't. They no. fought back. They took that constitution train. We had older chiefs. One of these people here was saying, your, it was uh, your grandfather that went. We had people, yes. We had people who went down into, right into Ottawa. They weren't afraid of the white politicians or uh, Trudeau. That's what being a warrior is. It's being standing up there, protecting your people. That's what it means. And, but, and that's not, oh, well, we got to make a deal because, you know, uh, we're we're scared and uh, there's uh, too many women who are stronger than us out here. That's not what it is. Okay, what's your point? I'm not trying I'm trying to understand your point here. Whatever comes out of it, there's no happen. No, I don't understand that. I don't understand that attitude. That's, uh, that, that is like, like City Grill, grill and, 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 and Custer didn't take it. They didn't stand there and say, go ahead, Custer, you have less men than us, kill us. They they fought. That's what we that's what we're saying right now. We need our men to warrior up right yeah, now. Exactly. We need our men to stand up. Because we're the ones who are standing up. Yeah. And I don't care too. Like, I'm not gonna let that, I'm not like gonna let that be taken on my reserve. Right through my reserve, Morley Reserve, probably the biggest reserve and one of the most beautiful reserves in Canada. The Trans Canada runs through that reserve and we will stand there on that road and we will get killed just to protect that. We're not gonna stand. Oh God, it's the best we can do, we're taking it. And when we talk about leadership, what about the leadership that sold out to Randy Wallace? You want to talk about that? Let's do that. Okay. Enough of enough of selling out to the white man. Like enough. Rolling over here and saying, oh, we could just go to let it go and go flow with the punches. 
You can no, do that. You can do that. Uh, you can you can actually you can uh, actually this was a good yourself. conversation until you're like telling everybody to give up and roll over. Yes, it sounds that way. Oh my god. That that's it. You're not looking at the reality. You're looking at no, we're not accepting it. You're looking you want at, to accept it, leave. You're looking go. at you're looking what Just the go. You're looking at what colonization has oh, done. You're being a colonizer. You're looking at what, what assimilation has done and saying that they're stronger than us and that and that what we have can't beat that. That's what you're saying. You're just but you know it would be better if you good. we'd be better if you bet we're we're a man that would help us more. Yeah, we need a warrior here. We don't need someone that's gonna roll over and say, Oh, let's just go, let's accept it. Hi. Yes. yes, it is. No, you did not. Well, you say said that. we're gonna have to take it. <laughs> now it's gonna oh, be now he's saying he wants to fight. Yeah, okay, oh, now it's gonna that. be fighting. <laughs> I'm tired. I gotta yeah, go. we gotta go. Tired of being the biggest guy in the room. Oh, tired of having bigger balls. Tired of having bigger can't... balls than the men in the room. We're gonna go in the wrong path. We're not stupid. Either. Does anybody want to say anything? Maybe. Does anybody want to say something? Anything? A man with uh, some good words. Oh, right here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. They fought hard. I agree. Exactly. Can I just say one thing? I missed a whole bunch and I had to go pick up my cell phone up. But, um, okay, it's a huge issue. But when uh, when we discovered that uh, Brandon Wallace was taking our casino lot and uh, everything, and our range, so Magnus, our chief, was acting like this had happened, um, this right here, I have. December 2023 land title and it is still Randy Walters. Um, no, but I told the, one of the senators of FSIA, Harry Cook, and he said to me, and he's very reputable, he kicked Randy Wallace out of the uh, Sally Gilbert, whatever, La Garage band. He kicked him out. It's a long time before he showed up in Battleford. Uh, anyway, he said, You are a sovereign nation. Time for sovereign nation. When you really know you are, when you really realize you are the bosses of your land, you stand up and do what you have to do. I think people don't realize that they have the power because they have to fight sovereign nation. They have the power not to let people walk through them, the federal government, uh, weasel, speak that come in. The tribal council must be. Council, anyway, it's a federal government idea. Um, we have the power, and it's a matter of, of letting all of us, men and women and children, and help to believe in their nation. Like mm -hmm. Shut it down before we have a fight. <laughs> We're gonna start because I am going to start fighting. And I'm not even in of my territory. Of course, that has to happen in little time. <laughs> of course, that has to happen when I'm here. Best, though. Thank and here, you here, so here's, much. here's our last I one. Think Don, Chief about. Donnie wants to say something. Just like, uh, thank these two for coming out there. I just need a minute that I make it today. Like, I'm not here. Like, as a chief, I'm here as a pepper. I seem to be living a long time with this. So, like, I was strong, really. But like they said, like, what I do now. I got to look at the future of my grandchildren and their kids and everybody down the road. And I'm not in a rush, you know, to get this money because how fast is it going to be gone like that quickly. So we really, really got to talk about this and we got to decide where, where we want to go. 
Like, I'm not going to sit here and sign it and say, this is good. We're going to take this money. No, no, I'm not. Well, he's an idiot. I'm not. I run for cheap, not being here cheap, just for money. I'm here for a future. That's why I'm putting up the fight with like just ran to get our land back and everything else because I want little time to take care of themselves in the future. So this is a big thing that we have to watch too. So convince and talk and do your homework and open up your mind to everything else. And just don't look at that dollar sign. Just influence everybody yeah. else around us. Just give it to your homework. Hey, that's all you gotta do is just help each other. Let's help each other to I know like it might take us a long time. That's why we're kind of debating. Like we haven't rushed it. You know, I I watch on Facebook, everybody is like, what's happening in the college club? Let's get it moving. Yeah, and so we gotta really, really think about this. Like we said, we are losing savings. Like, look at our health, look at our education. We're begging for it. But Dan talked about the year. I want to do that. Like, we do this 10 year, we'll do all this money. No, we're not going to do that. You can have a, you can talk about, take that money and then spend it in two years. And then what? What are you going to do for the next eight years? You know what I mean? We got to think about things like that. It's a long road. So just stand together and let's help people, help each other, and just. Try to find tracks for everything. Like talk to like right now, like I'm talking to another band that received their money and got talking to the people at an origin band or whatever. And I'm not talking to CNC, I'm just talking to what they think about getting their money in. Eh? So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm kind of being moving around and kind of and they they have their options too of why they shouldn't have got it right away too, like a lot of people, but a lot of people are also waiting to count down like where's my money? You know what I mean? That's it's, it's bad. Like it's, but we are like we gotta, yeah, yeah. We gotta stand together and make a good, solid choice for our future of little time. That's all I got to say. And thank you, Rachel and Dan, for coming out. Brilliant for setting this up. Sorry, I was late. Listen online and talk. Like make sure I enjoyed the Sunday was real cool. So thank you guys all for all coming out. Oh, so yes. well, I don't know how many people are coming to travel. I mean, you know, I'm going to get my company to me. Yeah. 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 When you think about this, the water safety patriots are a full province. Yeah, no more song. He was here, he was here, he was here, he was え、このままにえ、ここまでの責任なんだ。いっぱいはいるよ。あ、そうなんとも言ってなかなかできてもらう。いっぱいはいるよ。そしてそのとと方の人。よくしてし、パッと名前はなんか言うとるよ。よくては
Then a new created, the face again, the art master, Lolly. You soon want to take this ball by ball, long land, yeah. So you have to have Lolly excited to know what we can do. Over the right one, we give us some more, I'm going to go by ball. I try to go by ball. Jag tror att jag är det. Jag vill nog inte ta det. Jag tror att jag är inte så 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 att jag är ハブルトンネルはこのようにパンを通す。え、サボパイ。パイティーコーナーね。サボタイのサービスをデイス。イルウィッシュはデブティ。オバマネガチモチデセルリテテソ。オーシリネバーシュレンダー。ハブテマシ
Also, there's some beautiful baking and pies at the back. Like that's, you should go and support that wonderful woman that made all of that beautiful baking. It's lovely. It's homemade. It's from the land. <laughs> Calm down. Thank you so much, Little Pine, for having me here. You guys were fabulous, a fabulous group. We know Great questions. Went. And um, there's a lot of history here um, in Little Pine that you should be proud of and be, you know, um, teaching the children. And thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to go and buy a pie. <laughs> we got money to buy a pie now. Thank you. Are you sticking our food? I'm going in our bottle for, yeah, for, for a dinner. Is this fundraiser? Or so I'm going to go. Oh, Fun, legal fundraiser or a painful. You didn't bring my wallet in for it. No. And you left the oh, box. Okay. 